Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I believe y'all can hear me. Um, good morning and welcome to Counter All Joy as y'all come in. Let me know where you are tuning in from. Good morning, Kayla. I'm on YouTube. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, because I'm on a restream app or because I'm on an app, um, depending on what platform you're in, I cannot see your name. So you come in, if you could just drop your name um, and let me know where you're watching from. Uh, we are excited to get started this morning. Um, for those of you who are Joining us for the first time, my name is Joy Pittman, and this is Counted All Joy. This is our daily prayer cast where we come on um, and start our day with faith and gratitude um, and reminding ourselves to count it all joy, um, really these journeys that we are on. Um, so I'm really excited about this. Um, again, as you settle in, let us know where you're joining from. Let us know in the comments. Um, we are a chatty community here, so we like to talk back. Um, it keeps me engaged and connected when y'all are responding to me and letting me know that you are here and engaged. So I'm uber excited about that. Before we dive in or dig in, um, just some reminders and announcements. When Faith Meets Strategy, the crossroad um, is May 2nd through the 4th. Um, it is May 2nd through the 4th. If you have not gotten your tickets, um, I see some of you guys started getting your tickets. So if you have not gotten your tickets, please do so. Um, if you need, the tickets are 175 um, for regular 250 for 225 sorry, for VIP. If you need the option for a deposit, if you need to leave a deposit, so just let us know that you are coming. Drop a one in the chat. Um, we're trying to set that up without breaking the page. So I'm doing some of this on the back end. Um, so I need to set up an additional link. But if that would be helpful to you to get registered um, and be able to leave a $75 deposit or 50% deposit, just drop a one in the chat so we can make sure um, that we can get that out to you. We are going to um, get started today. We are continuing. Um, I believe that we're continuing in our weeks of victory as we're closing out um, the end of this month. Um, in the next few days, I'm excited. Also, for those of you in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, happen to be in New York area on March the 27th, which is tomorrow, Wednesday evening. I have the privilege of sharing at the Seven Last Words service at my church, the Freedom Church, um, located at 1980 Fulton Street. So if you are um, available to show up, I'd appreciate it. Tag somebody in um, that needs to be here, and we are going to get started. Yesterday, before I went live, um, I opened up my Bible, and God took me to Daniel 1. So when I opened the Bible, we landed on Daniel 1, and I thought that that is where we were going to be um, yesterday for the conversation, and um, that is not where we landed, right? So for whatever reason, um, God took us in a very different direction. I think it was a necessary direction. And then after I spoke to you all and I had the call, so I was able to get on the call um, yesterday for the first time with um, the new role that I'm stepping into. Um, and God made it really clear to me why we were in Daniel, but he also made it clear to me why we were on this journey that we've been on over the last few months now. We're in week 30 of this journey. And so... Um, God really began to, I guess, clarify for me. So we're going to go back to Daniel 1. And I feel, I'm feel, i sorry, y'all. I feel like we'd be redundant. I feel like we'd be going back and forth between the same scriptures over and over again. We're going to go back into Daniel 1 um, and spend a little bit of time in Daniel 1 today. Um, and then we're going to pray. And I will see y'all tomorrow. Um, so let's go to Daniel 1. Um, we're just going to read through it. Um, I'm reading in the NASB the National New American Standard Bible. Um, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king told Ashenaz, chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. Some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal families and of the nobles, youths in whom there was no impairment, who were good looking, suitable for instruction in every kind of expertise, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability to serve the king's court. And he ordered Ashpenaz to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. I want you to hold that. He wanted them to specifically be taught the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. 
The king also allotted for them daily rations of the king's choice food from the wine which he drank and ordered that they be educated for three years. So he wanted them to be educated for three years and to be taught the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Okay. Now among them was the son and after they um, were educated at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and then the command of the officials assigned the new names. And to Daniel, he assigned the name Belt, Belt Shezazar, right? To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he may not defile himself, Right. Um, and we go on, the scripture says, so they, he didn't allow them to defile themselves. Y'all know the story. It says, so he gave them what they asked for. And it says, as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every kind of literature and expertise. And Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. So they went to learn the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And it says, and God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every kind of literature and expertise. Right. When the days came when they were supposed to be presented to the commander of the officials to Nebuchadnezzar, he talked to them and out of them, no one was found um, better than Daniel. And so they entered into the king's personal service. As for every man of expertise and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them 10 times better. So understand that they are brought in to learn the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. We're going to unpack that. And because they did not defile themselves, they then were able to excel and to be brought into the king's personal service. So now Israel is now brought into the personal service of the king of Babylon. And they're sought out for expertise. They're sought out for understanding. They're sought out for consultation and they were always 10 times better than all the soothsayers, the priests, and the conjurers who were in his realm. I want you to begin to understand that God has been prepping many of us and preparing many of us to be servants or to serve right in areas of influence, in areas of consultation, in areas of expertise. Um, he has been calling us and positioning us to serve in those areas, right, through the lens and through the realm of um, still maintaining your connection as a child of Israel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My brother's on here. So good morning, Moonbeam. Um, I want us to understand um, that some of us, there's this idea of being in the world, but not of it, right? Sometimes we're so worried about getting away from the world, getting snatched out of the world, getting plucked up. But I believe more and more as we are navigating this particular time and life that we are in, more of us are being pulled up out of Israel proverbially or being pulled up out of the comforts and the stabilities and the, the safety of our um, focus on just kind of leaving our jobs and going back. And we're being uniquely prepared and positioned to sit in seats of influence and authority in relation to systems that we are not necessarily supposed to be a part of, but we are being called into. So the Bible tells us to be in the world, but not of it. The Bible tells us to be in it, but not of it. But I believe that many of us are being uniquely positioned in it, not to be of it, but to influence it. We're being put in it to influence it and to bring change in it and to be consultants and to be strategists and to be sought out and to give wisdom and to give knowledge. So understand they are brought into captivity only to be elevated to a seat of influence over a kingdom that is not necessarily the kingdom they're supposed to be in. Same thing we see with Joseph. Joseph is brought out by means of captivity or what seemingly is not positive means. He didn't migrate on his own. He didn't decide one day to be over there, but he snatched out and brought out of, betrayed by his brothers and brought out of a system that was his home, that was his comfort where his God, right, was acknowledged. And he's put into a system, a Babylonian system, a very Egyptian system, a very different system where his God is not always centered, where his, um, 
His religious beliefs are not always the most prominent, but he's brought and set in a position to advise the Pharaoh, to advise the king, to sit in the ear of. So let's look at, because I want us to really understand that what God is preparing us or requiring us to do is to get grounded and rooted in our personal faith, get grounded and rooted in it, it what it is that we need to know our prayer time, our devotional time, our relational time with God to get rooted and grounded so that we can be trusted to be placed in places that do not serve our God, placed in places that do not necessarily acknowledge him, placed in places and still operate in excellence and influence those industries. For too long, right, we have been okay with and we have gotten accustomed to going in and running out. I'm going to go in and then I need to run back to safety. I need to go in and run back. When we look at these stories, there was no safety for them to run back into. They were positioned in these systems and had to operate and thrive and navigate in these systems without conforming, without defiling themselves, without lowering themselves, without minimizing themselves. They had to operate in it in order to influence it. Some of you are stuck and struggling because you will not master the industries and the spaces that God has given you. Some of you strategically, God is repositioning and replacing back into systems that you tried to escape from because there's a work there for you to do. And I want you to begin to understand you are more than able, you are more than equipped, you are more than capable and more, more than competent of overcoming in these areas. Are y'all with me? If y'all with me today, talk back to me in the chat. So let's understand what was the significance, right? What was the, the significance of the language and the literature of the Chaldeans? Let me pull up my notes. Sorry, y'all. The significance of this, right, it has a number of things or a number of focuses that I want us to look on, right? First of all, learning the language and the literature of the Chaldeans was a means for Daniel and his friends to integrate into Babylonian society. It allowed them to communicate effectively, to understand cultural nuances, and to engage with the intellectual and scholarly transitions of their environment. So when we start thinking about right? Understanding what it is that we are called into, there are some areas where God is putting us in just to learn the language. Oftentimes we're in church, when you think about your prayer time, when you think about your focus time, we're in Daniel 1, when you think about your, um, when you are praying, think about it from this perspective. For those of you, and I want you to just type in the chat and drop your industry in the chat. So what industry do you work in, right? So I know that Teresa is a grant writer. I know that Paula um, Paula um, Jones does some um, human resources and has some administrative background. Begin to drop in the chat what your industry is. I want you to understand that as you know your industry or become versed in your industry, you have the unique ability or the unique capability to pray differently because you understand, right, the back ends of your industry. So for those of you, like you said, you're in medical billing, there's certain coding, there's certain um, verbiage that is used when you are entering diagnoses or how things get treated or how they get addressed. Correct me if I'm wrong. So if I am in that space and I begin to pray or God is calling me to intercession, I have a different understanding of different diagnoses, different systems, different ways that things move or navigate through a medical system, even as a biller, even as somebody, I may not have to be a doctor, I may not have to be a nurse, but I begin to understand and begin to break down and understand how these things get um, diagnose. What are some of the diagnoses? What are some of the, the treatment plans that people go on? How these things are built. So you become uniquely positioned through times of intercession where some people are like, Lord, just in healing, you can specifically call out diseases and call out diagnoses and call out different things because you have learned and become learned and knowledgeable in those systems right? Somebody's saying, I'm a hairstylist. I work in hairstyling or I deal with people's hair and engagement. There's ways that when you are engaging people, you are touching people, you are navigating people, you are in close proximity to them. So because of your industry, you are uniquely positioned to be an intercessor. You are uniquely positioned to pray and have a point of contact physically with people. You can talk when you are thinking about some of the things that impact us through our scalps, through our, so people are dealing with issues around um, 
hair and around those things, you are uniquely positioned to pray and to talk about it through the knowledge of your industry. When you're thinking about behavioral health, you are uniquely positioned when people are dealing with mental issues and the things that are coming up around us saying that we're seeking therapy, we're navigating those things. You are uniquely positioned through the language that you are learning in your career, in your industry, in your path to intercede, to pray. So we're just looking at it from a point of intercession to pray, to intercede, to call out certain things in healthcare, right? Insurance, when you're thinking about these things, these medications and some of the areas where these medications, um, where insurances are there, you're able to intercede and pr pr provide access. So I want us to think about as an accountant or in the accounting area, you don't have to just pray for wealth, but you can begin to talk about the spreadsheets and the balances. God begin to bring balance in certain areas. You can begin to talk about profit and loss. So where some of us only have the language of Lord help us financially or sin increase or sin this or sin that you as an accountant are uniquely positioned to pray at a deeper level if that makes sense drop a yes in the chat right I see you all dropping your things as human resources professionals we are uniquely positioned to pray over certain areas pray about gateways to entry we're able to pray and ask God to be able to open up the doors of employment but I don't just say Lord send them jobs I can say in God bless them on the interview give them the right words to say as they're navigating that conversation that person. God, give them insight into the mission. Give them insight into vision. God, allow them, oh God, to not deal with discrimination. Allow them, oh God, not to be seen. God, help them, oh God, elevate the things on their resume that need to stand them out. God, as their resume is sitting on that desk, God, begin to train the eye of the recruiter to focus and let their name be. I can pray in a more strategic and intentional and appointed way in the area that I have knowledge. And what the enemy has continued to do is to minimize our influence and even minimize our intercession. We're just going to focus on prayer to minimize our intercession because we keep operating in our industries like we just going to run in there and run out. We keep playing hide and go seek or whatever that game is. We had to run in and get, get out before getting tagged. Right. We keep playing that in our industries where God wants us to take the time to learn the language and the literature, to learn the, the verbiage, to learn the communication, to learn the underpinnings, to learn the information that is necessary about our industries. Why? So that we can stand in the gap and intercede and to influence and impact systems. He wants some of us to be trusted advisors, to leaders. Think about Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar that he has to interpret dreams. Think about the things that the different shifts when you read through the book of Daniel, I want us to commit April to really read through the book of Daniel, understand Daniel's positioning and different decisions that it was harder for the king to make because of his care and connection to Daniel. We miss sometimes the assignment because we have conditioned ourselves to believe that in the world, but not of it meant that you just dip your toe in real fast and run back to the other side. In it, but not of it still means that you be in it. And we have indoctrinated people at times to believe that they are not strong enough, that they are not equipped enough, that they are not capable enough to navigate the systems of the world without being switched or without being turned. When I grew up, I was even told at times, you don't need to be at that family reunion. You need to come back to church. At some point, and I'm not being shady, there was, va there was value and wisdom in that. When I wasn't strong enough to go to the family reunion and not drink and not turn up to the music and not do all the things that were embedded in that experience. Experience. If I wasn't strong enough to go out to those events, to go to those things because I was going to switch up. But when I got stronger, when you begin to get stronger in God, God can entrust you to go be in the places, to go be amongst the people, to go engage in those things and not be overtaken by them, to be an example. If we constantly keep running behind the walls of the church building, we never get to operate as the actual church. If we never step beyond the doors of the church, we don't get to show up as the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. The value of you being called out and, and differentiated is to show your difference among those that are all the same. If all of the called out ones are called out together, how are we impacting and influencing those that need to see the difference? 
And God is trying to build us up and strengthen us and make us foundationally strong in our prayer, being able to count it all joy, to persevere, to push forward, to carry weight, to hold up things in the spirit. He is calling us to do that. Why? So that we can be strategically placed back in the places and the systems and the industries that God has called us to. To be honest, religion is also a system. There are some of us that are earmarked to be placed in the religious system, to be in it, but not of it, meaning to show forth the actual purity of God, to show forth what God desires for us in a system that also has been susceptible to the enemy's devices. There is no system in this world that has not been impacted by the enemy trying to subdue it and overcome it. So there are some of us that, yes, even in your ministry assignment, you think I'm in the church, but you're still in it and not of it, right? I'm in this system, but I'm not necessarily operating the way some of these systems are operating because I'm called to set an example. A lot of people spoke on Sunday. I heard a lot of different messages about Jesus going into the temple and flipping the tables and coming after the money changers. What you have to understand is that that impact was him being in it, but not of it. He went into that space, but he did not conform to what they were doing. He set an example. You cannot keep looking at your job, your business, your profession, your school as this thing that you go in and just kind of sit in your corner and keep your head low and run out of. God is positioning us to influence industry. He's positioning us for souls and systems. We talked about that. He's positioning us for individuals and industries. And we have to understand that we are called to both. Daniel is taught the language of the Chaldeans. Let's continue to read through what that, how that works. There was also access to knowledge. It says, by mastering the language and literature of the Chaldeans, Daniel gained access to a wealth of knowledge, including science, math, philosophical advancements of the time. This knowledge was later useful in his service to the Babylonian court and his interpretation of dreams and visions. His proficiency in language and literature opened doors for Daniel and his friends in terms of career opportunities and advancement within the Babylonian administration. Their education and linguistical skills put in li- linguistic skills positioned them as value assets in the king's court. Their understanding of language and literature allowed Daniel and his friends to navigate Babylonian culture more effectively. They were able to build relationships, negotiate social interactions, contribute meaningfully to the society that they were in. Right? It says his willingness to learn the language and the literature of the Chaldeans demonstrated his ability to be adaptable and resilient in the face of adversity. And despite being exiled from his homeland and thrust into a foreign culture, he embraced the opportunity to learn and grow and ultimately use his knowledge for God's purposes. If the Bible says that God allowed them to be wiser in these learnings than other people. So why would God put me in an industry or in a system that is not directly under him and allow me to excel in knowledge there? Why would he allow me to be in a system that does not inherently look like what I'm supposed to be in and excel? Read the, read the text very closely. When we look at it, it says, and God allowed them, once they decided in their hearts not to defile themselves, it says God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every kind of literature and expertise. And David even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And at the end of it, they're now elevated to, and they were, they were, they were elevated to enter the king's personal service. And for every matter of expertise and understanding, the king was consulting with them. So their ability to know and understand and be grounded in what they came and what they brought out of Israel, and then to understand the culture that they had been placed in, allowed them to be expert consultants, to be clear about their positioning in the kingdom or in the body of Christ. Some of us are living beneath our privilege because we won't master our industry. We won't master the industry that God put us in. We won't master the place that we are in. 
If each of you think back, even to you, if you are working on a nine to five job, write a one in the chat. If you are operating in that space and not walking into that space every day with the process or the thought process, good morning, Dr. Connie, with the process or with the focus of mastering your industry, you are actually living beneath the privilege of what it is that God is calling you to. If you're walking in there and just doing mediocre work to get your check and leave, you are missing on the opportunity. If you are not praying strategically and asking God to place you on the project and the assignment, if you are not thinking about how to unpack and how to dig into and better understand what it is that God is calling you to understand, you are actually missing the purpose of the assignment. And some of us, even in ministry, we are ran to ministry to hide in ministry because it is comfortable. And God has already told you that he has earmarked you for the marketplace. He has already called you for the marketplace. He has equipped you for the marketplace. And the marketplace is not about your visibility. It is not about you securing the bag. It is not about you becoming great and famous. What it is about is about you being able to take and to utilize the knowledge that you have as a king, as, as, a, as a kingdom citizen as somebody that God has earmarked to be in an industry and to walk into that industry and to bring change and to bring shift. When we understand the power of Daniel's positioning, even in a space of captivity, he is able to do four, five things that I want you to understand. One, he navigates with integrity and wisdom, right? He focuses on performing his duties excellency, excellently, right? And he's able to do that. Why? Because he is moving through in a way that God is allowing or he's allowing God to use his positioning to have impact. You are being positioned for impact. You are being set up to be impactful. And oftentimes we just trying to get back to church where God is saying you are the church positioned in the world to bring Christ to them. You are already the church. You are already the ecclesia. You are the called out ones. Our assignment in this hour is to prepare a world for the return of Christ. We are positioned, we are called, we are mandated to prepare a world for the return of a savior so that they don't miss him a second time, so that they don't miss him. And as long as we keep looking at our responsibility as going back and building a church, we don't allow ourselves to be the church. We don't allow ourselves to be what it is that God is calling us to be. So yes, we need places of refreshing. Yes, we need places to go back and be refilled. Yes, we don't need to forsake the assembly of the saints. I do not want anybody to get what I'm saying twisted this morning. Yes, we need places where we converge or we are built up, but we have to understand that that building up, that training, that teaching, those anointing, the spirit. When the Bible talks about in John, he says um, he says that, if, that he would... Um, that for those of them that will receive Christ, right, that we would be the living water would flow out of us. Let me make sure I'm quoting it correctly, right? That living water would flow out of us. That living water flowing out of us, it doesn't just say that you were going to contain it. It says that it's going to flow out of you. The value of something flowing out of you is that it will impact other people. If we're just flowing on each other, who is being impacted? Who is being built up? Who is being who is being poured onto? The Bible talks about in the last days he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. If we are those that living water is flowing from our hearts, do you not consider that we are part of the living water or we are part of the pitchers? We are part of the pour that God is going to use to pour out on everyone. But instead, we want to be okay pouring out on each other because it feels safe. Get out of your safety. Stop worrying about your safety and your comfort. Stop worrying about your safety and your comfort. The Bible says in John 7 and 37, now on the last day and the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But he said this in reference to the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So he says this spirit is coming out. It's going to flow. Why don't you see yourself as a pitcher or as a pourer of that spirit? He said in the last days, I'll pour out on all flesh. You are part of the poor. We are part of the poor. We are part of what God uses to pour onto others. And God is asking us to be comfortable, not just pouring and saturating each other. He is calling us to something higher. I was trying to figure out why Daniel, and I had a conversation with the organization I'm going to be working for, and God made it very clear to me. Yes, you're going to learn, go in and learn. Yes, you are going to go in and learn the language. Because there need to be interpreters in the kingdom. God is trusting some of us. God, I thank you this morning to be bilingual. To understand both the language of Israel, the language of Judah, the language of the kingdom and the language of Babylon. Because I cannot effectively communicate what I do not understand. I cannot effectively convey what I myself do not understand. And we live beneath our privilege when we decide to only be unilingual. Your industry, the place that God is calling you to, the place that God is calling you to affect, you have a responsibility to learn their language, to be in it, but not of it. To study, to show yourself approved, a workman, right, unto God that needed not be ashamed. We are able to rightly divide the word of truth when we better understand the context. Jesus did not come and speak to people just from his lens. When he began to break down parables, it was because he took the time to understand. He didn't come into the earth only speaking heavenly. He took the time to explain through agriculture. He talked to them about the bride. He talked to them about oil in their lamps and keeping their oil right and not missing it. He talked to them about marital marriage rituals. He talked to them about the good wine and the wine skins. He talked to them about planting seed and fallow ground. He's talking to individuals at the level that they understand. He took the time to understand and to learn their culture so that he could impact their faith, that he could impact their faith at their level. Paul goes in when he talks about the message on Mars Hill. He begins to take time to observe and to understand what their culture was so that he could present to them the unknown God. We see scripture. We see scripture. Nowhere in the scripture do we see the disciples just sitting around the disciples talking about being disciples. It is not biblical. Nowhere in those scriptures do we see them not being dispersed and sent on assignment into the world to preach and to teach and to proclaim the good news of Christ. Nowhere in the world do we see the prophets not being assigned to kings and to kingdoms and to give advice and guidance. Nowhere do we see the, do, no, we don't see this model anywhere. So what made us believe that we were just supposed to huddle around each other five days a week and never understand and learn and delve into the industries and the places that God has given us? What makes you think that you're not supposed to operate in excellence in the industry that God has called you to? What makes you think that if he's put you in the medical field or the legal field or in marketing or in medical billing, or if he has you mopping the hallways of a school somewhere, what makes you think that we are not called even in places that feel like captivity to not operate? operate in excellence. Joseph has to operate in excellence in a prison. Daniel is in exile, but he's calling us not only to be excellent, but to be set apart. God will use your service. Your vocation is worship. Your work is as unto the Lord. God, I thank you this morning. You are called to operate and to be impactful in the areas that he has called us to. Some of us, yes, will be entrepreneurs, but some of us will have to operate in our occupation. I heard somebody say this phrase, occupy in your occupation. You will have to lock in and show forth the excellency on that job you do not like. There is knowledge. The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And you know what we reduce that to? Money. We reduce wealth to money because our minds are not expanded enough to understand the wealth of the wicked being laid up for the just also means the wisdom, the savvy, the knowledge, 
The wicked are navigating industry. The wicked are excelling in marketing and excelling in certain fields and in medicine and in finance. The wicked are excelling. The wealth of the wicked, the knowledge, the competency. God, I thank you. The God, I thank you this morning. God, I thank you. There's so much wealth that is held up and we are struggling on our industries. We are struggling in our churches. We are struggling in our personal lives because we do not understand that the wealth of the wicked is not a bag of money. It's not a computer glitch. It's not somebody dropping like on Coming to America where Eddie Murphy dropped that bag of money. It, it's not reduced to that. That the wealth of the wicked, that the wicked have excelled in industries. Understand, Daniel goes into Babylon and is able to, in three years, learn and grapple with and make sense of and take in knowledge that it took many of them years and years to excavate. Some of you are going to be put into jobs, into opportunities, in organizations where it took somebody 10 years to build into a level of expertise. And you're going to go in and be able to excel and to learn it in six months and to in 12 months and be able to grasp it and grapple with it. God is going to expand our capacity, but you have to walk in with the right mindset. One, I'm not going in here to defile myself. I'm going to be set apart. I'm going to show forth God's excellency. I'm going to get to work on time. I'm going to be at my desk. I'm going to read before the meeting. I'm going to prepare myself. Why? Because God is teaching you something. There are some things on your jobs, if you locked in and learned it, all the things that you're concerned about where you're, the church building or the church that you're a member of your local church is deficient in, you could take all that knowledge back if you would actually focus on your job. If you stop reading your Bible at your desk and started reading the handbook. If you stop spending time on your, at your job planning your next conference and actually paid attention to what it is that you are learning in industry. If you start spending time answering your pastor, and I'm not being shady, but some of you have to set better boundaries. I am at work and my work is worship. I am at work and this is how I example what it is that I'm taught to lean on, to trust in. Some of you are stealing from your jobs. I have done it. Stealing from your jobs, being thieves at your jobs and lifting your hands on Sunday morning. You ain't did no work on that job. You have done no work on that job. You have not done any of the prep work. You have not given those people the seven hours that they paid you for. You are stealing to pay your tithes. So how are we any better than the money changers? How are we any better than the people that God flipped the table on where we're turning it into a den of thieves? We are coming to church on Sunday as thieves because we have stolen all week from our jobs, not giving what we were supposed to give in our efforts and in our time and in our energy. Some of us are stealing from our clients. We're doing the bare minimum on their projects. We're not operating and serving from a place of excellence. So we are thieves. And God requires more of us. God requires more from all of us. You can excel on that job. He told you to be on that job. Don't treat it like a prison sentence where you just mark it off. God, what is the purpose of me being here? Industries are shifting and we are not part of the conversation. We're not influencing the shift. Things are changing. Laws are moving. Laws are being discussed. Conversations are being had. And we're not even part of the debate. God requires more of us. He requires more of us. He requires more of us. This season that we're in, for some reason, is making me really sober. And some days it makes me really sad how we are treating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That we have traditionalized it. I don't know if I'm making that word up. That we know what we do during this time of year. But are we making his death to no effect? Are we making his sacrifice to no effect when we don't actually operate in the purpose that he died for? 
Singing the hymns is good. Doing the sacraments is nice. Rejoicing over the fact that he got up. Great. I, I, I want, I do, I'm doing all that stuff. He got up. Us going to town over, he got up. But what did he get up for? What did he get up for? If he got up with all power, why are we living powerless? If he got up with all power, why are we living beneath our privilege as a, as a, why are we making the decision to live beneath our privilege? God requires more of us. Hey, E, he requires more of us. He requires more of us. Daniel is taken out of his home and intentionally placed by God in a Babylonian system to learn the system. To navigate and move through to places of prominence in that system to be an advisor to kings, to be his voice in the room. God, I thank you. To be his voice in the room. You sitting on your job, not being promoted, just counting your time and being comfortable when he's calling you to be his voice in the room. He's calling us to be his voice. God, I thank you. His voice in the room. There are people that need to hear what God has to say. God is kind to us. God is kind to us and he is faithful to us. In some of your industries, God never intended for you to be in that spot for that long. He never intended for you to not get promoted. He never intended for you to stay stuck there. He's waiting for you to understand the purpose of your assignment. He's waiting for you to operate in excellence. He's waiting for you. God, I thank you. And if you can, we can be, all have been guilty. Moonlighting at work, moving papers from one side of the desk to the other, watching the clock, waiting for it to be over, doing the bare minimum. We've done it. I've done it. Maybe not all of us. I've done it. I'm looking back now on the jobs and the placements and the opportunities that God gave me to excel, the things I did not complete, the things I did not finish because I did not understand that God was trying to position me to be an influence and a voice. And in his kindness and in his mercy, he still chooses to use us. In his kindness, we've squandered, many of us have squandered opportunities and positions. If you think back now, you see God, you were, you were placing me, you were positioning me and I was not mature enough and I was not ready. And in his mercy and in his grace, he does not take it back but he wants us to be aware. We can't keep talking about the last days and that he's coming and not understand our responsibility to prepare a people to meet him. To prepare a people to meet him. God is kind to us. He is kind to us. He is kind to us. So we're going to pray, but I want you to own in this moment, there is an assignment connected to your positioning. It's souls and systems. It's individuals and industries that he is calling us to impact. He is calling us to have placement in. He is calling us to shift. There is a demand on your assignment. There's a demand on your gift. Etienne, there's a demand on your gift. There's a demand on your placement. There's a demand on these things that I have to learn so I can infiltrate. In the music space, God, I thank you. Music is used so much to create atmospheres, to shift atmospheres, to create atmospheres. Etienne, I'm talking to you. To create atmospheres, to, to, to set up atmospheres. And your knowledge of how notes work and how music works and how to ride the music and move through it. The same way the enemy will use that stuff to stifle and to shift moments. Even in worship settings, the enemy will use music to shift atmosphere and to create things that are not in alignment with making it easy for the spirit of God to operate and to move. Those knowledges, that understanding of the, of the intricacies, right, of music and of God uses that or he's using that or will use that knowledge to help you navigate and to create spaces where his spirit can really reign freely. 
our prayer time, our intercession time is different when we have language. So that knowledge is giving us language. Daniel is better positioned to talk prophetically about what is coming because he understands from both the Babylonian and the Israel perspective, right? He understands both. God is kind to us. God is kind to us. God is kind to us. We don't even understand that our presence and our knowledge in rooms shifts what the enemy can do. Those of you in the medical field, there are people that are earmarked to, to, to not treat us what, appropriately or correctly. Those of you in mental health, there are therapists that are positioned to keep people's minds in bondage. So you're, as you're navigating that field, you are standing in the gap. When God was showing me Nehemiah, it was a call to build walls and to rebuild the walls and the gates. To rebuild the walls and the gates. There's rebuilding that we have to do, but that building is a place of safety. So you're in spaces where God is calling you to build walls and to build gates, to build spaces, to keep the enemy at bay in certain areas to shift atmospheres through your prayer, through your intercession, through your worship, through your work, through your mastery, through strategy that God will give you in certain industries. But we have to be learned. This Bible doesn't say study the Bible to show yourself approved. It says study. Know your craft. If God placed you there, study it. What am I supposed to know? Some of you are sitting in business models right now. You asking God to help you be an entrepreneur and you're sitting in a business model that will that you can duplicate as you build and you're not even paying attention. Streams of income. Your employment is a stream. Your entrepreneurial pursuit is a stream. God will make ministry a stream if you are acknowledging him in it. He will create it. Rivers in the desert. God, I thank you. God, I thank you today. We're going to pray. We are at time, but we are almost at time. But I want us to really understand what we are praying about. So God, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you, oh God, for this time, oh God, of connection, this time of Bible study, this time of unpack. God, we thank you this morning for what it is that you are doing and what it is that you are calling us into. God, we repent right now, oh God, for being in the places that you have called us to be, but not understanding and being committed and locked into our assignment. We repent, oh God, for wasting time. We repent, oh God, for wasting resources. We repent, oh God, for not setting in our hearts and in our minds, not to defile ourselves by partaking from the things, oh God, that you have called us, oh God, to stand, oh God, in enmity against, to push back against. God, we repent, oh God, for not using the knowledge and the wisdom and the access that you have given us to learn and to understand, to be able to understand culture so that we can shift them, to understand industries so we can impact them. God, we repent, oh God, for not using our giftings and our talents, for burying them, for burying them at our jobs, for burying them at our computers, for burying them in laziness and complacency for burying them, oh God, as opposed to bringing them and producing and bringing you back a yield and bringing you back fruit and bringing you back surplus and multiplying what you have given us. We thank you for the minds and the talents that you have given us. God, we take on the responsibility to multiply them for your glory and for your use. God, we thank you this morning for not leaving us, oh God, in a place, oh God, where we're not clear and knowledgeable of our giftings and our understanding. Begin to clarify gifts. Begin to clarify your voice. Begin to show us, oh God, even on our jobs and the spaces that we are in, how we can operate in better excellence. God, some of us, oh God, have been mediocre, but we commit, oh God, to excellence. We've been doing the bare minimum. We buy. in our churches jobs and doing bare minimums god i'm asking in the name of 
jobs, in our history assignments, in our marketplace assignments that we serve as unto you, that we treat every day, every project, every opportunity as if you are looking at it yourself, as if you are marking it, as if you are checking it. We thank you now, oh God, for prominence. We thank you now that as we put forth our best effort, you will make up the difference. We thank you now, oh God, that as we do our best to learn and study, you would illuminate and make us even wiser than we could be in our own, oh God, make us even more gifted, more knowledgeable, oh God, than we could be just by studying in our own strength. God, we're asking, oh God, that you would make us exponentially better, 10 times better in our industries, not so that we can just say we're better, so that we can move to the places of prominence and that we can move to the places of influence and console that you are calling us to. I thank you, God, that even those that are operating as executive and administrative assistants, allow them to see their value. God, as wisdom givers and consultants and those that provide wisdom and knowledge and counsel to their leaders as trusted places, oh God, give them the strength, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we reaffirm in our hearts and our minds that we seek not to defile ourselves, not to be caught up into the things, not to be caught up at the water cooler conversations, not to be caught up in the gossip, not to be caught up in the way other people are doing things. We are not getting by, but we are more than conquerors through Christ. We thank you, oh God for mastery in our assignments. We thank you, oh God, for strengthening us in our assignments. We thank you, oh God, for showing us, oh God, how to conquer and how to thrive in the places that you have given us access to. Thank you, oh God, for political systems and industries. Thank you, oh God, for teaching us how to navigate the places. Thank you, oh God, for teaching us. Thank you that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, the wealth, the things that they have toiled in. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. We thank you, oh God, that just like the children of Israel walked into a promised land that was flowing with milk and honey that they did not have to plant, that they did not have to curate, that they did not have to cultivate, that it had walls and gates that were built and fortified by those that were already dwelling in it. We thank you that that is the same way that you are preparing wealth for us, that we will walk into places and be able to occupy and excel in things that it took people years and decades to build that you will give us immediate access once we set in our hearts to be pure before you. God, we thank you that knowledge and wisdom is our portion. We thank you that your word says in James 1, I believe in 5, that if we can come to you and ask for wisdom and you would give it to us unabraded not. We thank you, oh God, that we have access to your spirit. That the spirit understands and knows all things. We thank you that we serve an intelligent God. We thank you that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is brilliant is a genius. We don't have to feel unless then. We don't have to feel incapable as long as we are being guided and led by the Spirit of God. We thank you, oh God. We thank you and we give you glory and we give you honor. We accept our assignment to prepare a world for your coming. God, we thank you. We thank you, oh God. We thank you for our assignments to prepare a world for your coming, a people for your return. You desire that none is lost. God, give us that same burden that we desire that none be lost, that none be left out. God, we thank you for it, God. We thank you, God, and we count it as done in the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God is kind. He is kind. He is kind to us. He is kind to us. He is kind to us, and he wants more and better for us. He requires better from us. He requires bigger from us. He requires bigger from us. God is faithful. If you receive that today, drop a one in the chat. If you, I'm going to go back into my industry. I'm going to walk onto this job today with a renewed spirit of excellence. I'm going to operate from a better place. And I don't care what you do. There are no small jobs. There's no un unimportant work. Anywhere you are being positioned, God is placing you there. God is placing you there. We have a greater resolve. We have a greater intentionality. Hi, Jalen. We have a greater intentionality about our assignments in God. God is faithful to us. He is faithful to us. He is good to us. He is merciful to us, right? And we have a responsibility back to him. We have a responsibility back to him. I love you all. We are going to wrap here. Uh, we are going to go help you have a blessed day. Remember, have a dope day on purpose. If you have not registered, 
for the crossroad. Please register. I'm excited on that Friday. We're going to be doing Count It All Joy live that Friday morning. So we get to have um, the experience together. And I don't know about y'all, but I'll be feeling God in my little room. So I feel like if I feel him here, I'm excited about when we're able to come together and do it. The information is on the website, thecrossroad.info, thecrossroad.info, crossroad, no S, thecrossroad.info. I love y'all. Have a dope day on purpose and remember to count it all joy. And also for those of you that want to donate to the work that we're doing, here is the QR code, scan it, give if you want to, if you have the capacity to, if God puts it on your heart to, if he doesn't, that is fine and okay. Um, there's different areas that you can donate to, to support the work that we're doing. Um, some of the work that we're being asked to do requires us to travel over the next few months. Um, these are, we're not traveling to places where they can afford to put us in big hotels and pay for first class seats and all those things. So any of those donations that you give us um, go towards that. They go towards the conference, the event. They just allow us to show up and to serve. So I'm excited about what God is doing. Um, I love y'all. Again, have a dope day on purpose and count it all joy. See y'all tomorrow. <laughs>